and I will let him take it from there. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay, so um, you may or may not know me, and I've, uh, I've been around a couple of these meetups for just a few minutes, um, and then I usually go home for, for dinner because I'm very hungry. Uh, but today I thought this was a good opportunity to kind of impart some of the wisdom that I learned on the game that I made a couple of years back called Kansas City Shuffle. Uh, I'm going to warn you guys, might be a little bit advanced in terms of the programming knowledge, so just get a quick. Uh, Kind of view of the room here. Raise your hand if you're a programmer. And raise your hand, yeah, that's fine. And uh, raise your hand if you're using C Sharp or Unity so I can get some kind of, okay, that's <laughs> something. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever used inheritance before in a programming language. Okay, that's, all right, good, good, good. All right, that's, so we're not, we're not going to be completely um, off the rails here. So it's, it's, meant, it's meant for more beginner to intermediate uh, programmers that want to go a little bit more advanced. Kind of in the uh, co-organization of, of a Unity program, yeah, this will be applicable to other things as well. So really quickly, we're going to, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Nicolaus Mizarakis. Uh, I grew up in uh, New Hampshire, and then I went to school in Montreal. Um, I graduated last year, but throughout that whole time, I was doing internships and starting companies and so forth in Montreal. Um, and making my personal project, Kansas City Shuffle. I have another app that I'm working on now called uh, Pictominos. Hopefully that will be out later this year. We can do something fun on that. But for now, yeah, so I worked, first thing I was doing was uh, Square Enix Montreal. I worked on Hitman Sniper. That was in Unity. iOS Montreal, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. I was working on that for a year. I was in the Dawn Engine, some custom iOS engine. And then I uh, helped in the founding of Elastic Games. A couple of us, Square Enix Montreal, Employees invited me to start that company with them. And that's why I worked for about three years uh, doing a lot of kind of uh, support programming for them, engine stuff, uh, online connectivity, stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, there's a the little showcase there. And so, this was last year, fun, fun. And so, this talk is mainly going to be about this game, Kansas City Shuffle. So, this was a, uh, this was a car game that a friend of mine and myself and another friend of his came up with uh, at some point in you know, Shisha Bar, we were playing cards, and we like, oh, this is fun, make an app like this. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to practice coding skills uh, and code organization. So this is a turn-based game. Uh, yeah, really quick, let's do a little, little uh, summary on this. It's a turn-based card game. It's somewhat similar to Uno. Uh, there's lots of cards moving. We call these tweens. We're going to get to that eventually. There's a lot of different rules that you can put in, and there's a whole bunch of other features like undo reading buttons, uh, the standard game settings that you would have, and we're going to talk about kind of how to organize all of these things into some kind of coherent, uh, yeah, so use all the rules, there's a whole bunch of different, yeah, then you have a player set up that's kind of considered part of the rules, and yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of UI, uh, cards moving around, and if, uh, if there wasn't some kind of way to bring all this together and organize it, the code for this would get messy relatively quickly. So we're going to go through something called design patterns. Uh, with the exception of the finite state machine, that's not a design pattern. Uh, that's, that's, there's a one called the state pattern, but that's something different. This is just something really useful that probably should be a design pattern, especially for games. So we're going to go through that as well. Uh, we're going to start with singleton because that one's easy. And then we're going to do a little inheritance review to make sure we understand our polymorphism and everything, just in case we get some more beginner programmers. Uh, up to speed, and then we're going to go fly right through the factory method pattern, finite state machine, and pattern flyweight. And we'll look at the Betsy delegates because those are very important as well. Although not strictly a pattern, you can say the observer is a pattern, but it's a bonus slide. It's a slide. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So, uh, the design patterns. Uh, if you've ever taken computer science or a software engineering degree, it's a very influential book. It's written by the gang of four. Those four people ran into the title there. It's not a particularly amazing piece of graphical design on the cover, but it's, uh, it was very important, very influential in software engineering. Uh, kind of ushered in a new era of software engineering and um, really taught people how to use object-oriented programming in a way that was effective uh, around the time that Bjarne Sustrup was, was making C++ in order to kind of bring these inheritance and polymorphism features into uh, C++ from some older languages like Scout and so forth. So this is the book we're going to be basing some of these uh, off, but it's just a little bit of history here. All right, so we're going to start really, really easy. The singleton pattern. 
This pattern gets a lot of flack. Uh, it can be very easily abused if overused in a lot of factory applications, uh, uh, enterprise applications. You will perhaps see a little bit too many of these, and code can, again, this is basically a global variable, but it's a nice way of grouping together a global variable uh, that's easy to use. So basically, we have a class, okay, and then there's a static function that just gets an instance of the class, and that's the only instance of it you use, so that's called a singleton, and you can just throw a whole bunch of data in there. And that's, that's great, right? But how is that really applicable to game design and community? Well, one of the main things you're going to do at some point is probably going to have persistent data. By that, you can save game data or game settings data about resolution, stuff like that. Uh, and so this is an example of a good use of it. So usually there's only one of these existing in the game, and then you just write it to permanent storage, and then you go and get it back. So the moment, what would be really nice is, yeah, if you could just get this object, write uh, some data to it, like a boolean, and then write that to the disk, and then your game shuts off, starts right up again, you read it from the disk, and you have that data that you just set. So that's what we're going to try to do right here with this code example, verse 1. So uh, this is going to be C-sharp under, under Unity. And before we continue, I just want to say, yeah, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to just raise your hand. Uh, if, if this is going a little bit too fast, you're not quite sure what something is, uh, so, for example, this is kind of an advanced thing that you have to use it pretty often in Unity C Sharp. It's called an attribute. So this class, um, this is this is this is an attribute that makes this class easier to uh, write to the disk with C Sharp. So you'll see that in just a moment here. So we have uh, just a just a const string basically to be like, where am I going to put this file? And we have our singleton getter here. So we have this is this is a property. It could be a function, but now it's a property. You have a private static cached instance. You have this property, basically a function that says, basically, if this cached instance is null, read it from the disk and then return the cached instance, and then it won't be null anymore. Uh, oh, whoops. Yeah, there's a. I don't know. That's yeah. So the cached instance will be written to. Uh, it'll be overwritten here. So this will only be. Uh, this will only be executed once. This is known as lazy evaluation. So, and then you're going to have a private rule such as in, use inverted controls. This, again, I have another, um, another property to return it as is. And if you set it, you set it in RAM and then you write to the disk so that you can get it when you, uh, you fire up the game again. Excuse me. Okay. So, yeah, so these are the two functions. This is the rest of the class. So, this is writing to the disk and this is reading from the disk. As you can see, reading from the disk will actually set the cached instance. So this read from disk will only be called once, the first time that this class is kind of referenced. And the reason we do all this, but also this code, this is boilerplate. This is if you Google like how to serialize a class in C sharp, you basically get this. There's nothing fun and funky going on here. Uh, nothing particularly complicated. We're just gonna save it to the save set its file name path, and we're gonna read that from the disk and write it. The same way. So the reason we do all that is because the usage is incredibly simple. Okay. If your user uh, changes the state of the tick box in the options menu, you just say game data dot get dot controls equals true. That sets it. And then if you need to reference that somewhere in game, you do game data dot get dot controls. That's why I use properties. Is because this is basically just a class in global data that you can serialize to the disk and bring it back from the dead with no problems. It's just that easy and it just works. And this is kind of the theme. We're going to try to make the usage of, these, of this code look as, as beautiful and as simple as possible, even if there's a little bit of implementation detail in the background that you don't need to worry about. This is kind of the heart and soul of what game uh, the design pattern we're trying to do. So, Next up, we're just going to do a quick uh, review on inheritance. So this is a uh, is a versus has a relationship. So if one class inherits from another, it basically is a part. It, it is one of those classes, and then it also can define its own extra stuff after that. Uh, this is an example. On the top is a is going to be inheritance. On the bottom is composition. So this is the normal way of uh, referencing properties of another class, but we're going to be talking about the top one. Uh, the problem here is, 
That's not how you spell this word. You don't, you don't spell behavior, do you? Come on, guys. Okay? This is America, okay? And we are not a socialist country, so we spell a little differently, okay? There we go. That's much better. That's, that's, that's the way that it should be. Does anyone know where uh, Unity was, was created? I'll, I'll say it if I told you because I told some people before. Anyone? Denmark. Denmark. Denmark is the answer. But anyhow, so yeah, so this is the way it should be, not the way it is, but we're in America, so we're going to do it like that. Okay, so in code, what does this basically mean? We have a base class with public, protected, and private members. And by member, it could be a variable or a function, remembering our OOP. Um, and then we have, a, so this is just a base, and then we have derived. This means inherits from base. And what does this mean in code? It's very simple. This little extra bit means take everything that's right here in base and just shove it right here before the public string D. This is what a compiler actually does in practice. I know because I had to make one for my senior year. That was uh, something of a religious experience. It's very difficult. But this part is not, it's not, it's not too crazy. And please remember, everyone, that I'm doing on time. Uh, uh, all right, I'll, 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 I'll forego the demonstration of this until the end, but private. Do we inherit private variables, uh, private members rather? We inherit them, but they're not accessible, okay? What that means is if I have some function that calls C inside base, and then I call that function from, from derived, it'll still call that private function eventually, but you just can't access it otherwise from derived. And I have a demo for that, but we're going to go in the interest of time. So that's that. Polymorphism is a extension of this idea. So we have a base with a virtual function and we have a derived function that overrides that function. And what this means basically is we have four really possibilities here. We have a base uh, variable. It's assigned a new base. We have a derived. It's a new derived. We know what this is going to Okay. So debug log base and debug log derived. Okay. This, these, are the, uh, these are the test functions. So basically, this is pretty easy, right? We have base A equals new base, and new base is obviously an output base. Uh, derived B equals new derived, that's an output derived. And derived C equals new base, this is a compile error because you can't do that. That that's, goes against the grain of what uh, inheritance truly is because uh, we're going to say a, uh, a base is not a derived, but a derived is a base. Kind of similar geometric uh, phrase that goes along with that. But anyway, this is where polymorphism starts in. If you have a base variable and you assign it a derived um, object, it's going to, and you, and, you, and you call this function, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to print out derived. And this is what polymorphism is. This basically says that regardless of what the variable type is, it's the object type that matters when you're selecting which of these two functions to execute. And a lot of what design time is going to be is kind of taking this and really harnessing it and utilizing it to its fullest extent in order to make software useful. So we're going to go with the big one first, tweens. So in Kansas City Shuffle, we have a lot of cards moving around, all right? And the kind of term for this in the industry right now is a tween. There's a couple of libraries that will do this for you. This is my particular implementation. It's kind of similar to this, it's a little bit more complicated, but we'll get there. So we're going to alter a property of an object in Gimmick, uh, in this rather in Unity's case. Uh, we're going to like position, rotation, etc. over a specified period of time, like so. All right, we have a position and rotation, 0, 0, 0 degrees. We want to move it all the way over here, 5, 1, 4 degrees. Here's our card. Here's the path it's going to take. Let's say it takes one second, Bink. that's it, that's between. Um, this is good. This is, so we want to do a lot of these. And we want to organize them. And whenever we do one of these, we want the code to be as simple as possible. Uh, in Kansas City Shuffle, I'll kind of show you what it ends up looking like. But let's look at a naive approach first. Uh, this actually isn't too bad. This isn't amazingly naive. So we have a start position, end position, start time, and end time. And you lerp it. Vector 3.lerp. Start position, two end position using the time dot time as your, you know, as your, uh, as your, uh, your T variable, I guess you could say, alert. And it looks like this. All right, so we're going from 0, 0, 0 to 512. 
cube is at 0, 0, 0, 1, and we're going to have a start time is 3 seconds, end time is three, 6 seconds, so we're going to wait 1, 2, 3, it's going to move over 3 seconds to 5, 1, 2. Alright, this is a good start. Um, so let's see the pros and cons. Yeah, the, uh, the bezels on these screens are not doing my slides a lot of justice, unfortunately, so I just kind of bear with you with the, kind of through the, uh, through the text there. So pros are simple code for now. So this is a very simple example. There are about 20 different types of tweens in Kansas City Shuffle, mostly because UI requires their own tween, um, but I would say there's like six or seven that are strictly for cards and, and other game, uh, in game objects. Uh, another pro of this, compared to what I did in Kansas City Shuffle that I thought of, is that there's different timelines possible. So if you put, and this was a component that you saw before, so if you put a position tween component and a rotation tween component on a game object, you can have the position move from three seconds to six seconds, but the rotation move from, say, five seconds to seven seconds. Uh, this was not necessary in my case. Um, all of our tweens are pretty are pretty synchronous. Uh, they, they, all, they all start at the same time. It's just that they work on several different properties at once. So that is the behavior we're going to try to exploit in just a minute here. So the cons of this is it's not modular. Um, you can do one tween at a time. You can't really stack them easily. You can, but it's not lightweight. You've got to add a component every time. And you have to make sure that it's, you know, you would want it to be enabled when it's working and disabled when it's not. Uh, it's not dynamic. It's not easy to add or move them via code, as I'm trying to say. So we're going to make this a lot more lightweight. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to use the strategy pattern. Now, you kind of have to know UML before looking at these. Uh, UML is Unified Modeling Language. Uh, these are just substitutions for what this image is trying to kind of show here. So we have class name and attributes. Attributes just means members. Uh, and a generalization in this case just means inheritance. So scheduled flight, charter flight, compared to flight number over here. And what is it? Association is just a reference. So flight number references a type of plane. And then aggregation is kind of the same thing. It's, it's composition though as opposed to it's like this is composed of these objects rather than it's referring to another object. Uh, so, so given that kind of legend, let's look at the, uh, the strategy. It's pretty simple. It's basically what polymorphism was a couple slides ago. You have an abstract class, which just means a class you can't instantiate as uh, unusable functions that are meant to be implemented in its child classes. And you're going to select between one of those two, and you're going to do something different based on which one you use. And in this case, these are going to be tweens. So let's look at the UML as it exists in uh, a simplified version of how it's existing at Kansas City Shuffle. We have a tween holder. It holds several tweens. And in this case, to make it simple, we have a rotation tween and a position tween. And you can hold as many of those as you want. In practice, you would hold one or two because there's only two tweens. But Kansas City Shuffle, you could be holding six or seven. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, pattern on top. And this is the usage of tweens on the bottom. So I'm trying to show you in this case that uh, the design pattern pretty much just means that the UML is going to look similar to you know what the design pattern UML is. So the, the, the UML is going to be quite similar here. That's really all it means. Uh, the tween holder is going to handle the timing, and it's going to hold an array of this objects, not classes. Sorry about that. Uh, derived from the tween class, so position tween or rotation tween. Tween is going to be abstract. It means you don't actually instantiate a tween because it's it's not meant to be an implemented uh, class. It's supposed to be a parent class that everything kind of adheres to. And yeah, tween is abstract. Exactly. Okay. So let's look at the code for this to make this a little bit more concrete. Here's the tween holder. Uh, this is the whole thing. The one in Kansas City Shuffle is a lot more um, complicated. But basically, we have some simple stuff. We have the duration, delay, and the list of tweens. And remember, we're not actually going to put tweens in there. We're going to put classes derived from tween in there. And then we're going to execute their version of whatever they want to do to the uh, object. So it's either change its rotation or change its position. And this thing is chopping off the time elapsed. That's a, that's a property. You can, just, uh, you can derive that from the current time minus time started minus delay. 
You have percent done, uh, where you plant that to zero and one, and um, you're going to use this in betweens. And then you have the update function. It's pretty simple. If time elapse is less than zero, that means you're still in delay. Don't do anything. Just return. Uh, otherwise, we're going to go betweens for each uh, t dot on update. I should probably should put that in for loop, but I just kind of this is a I have a library that kind of does this for me. So I don't like using more than one line for a for loop sometimes. The, uh, and then we have to, if time elapses is greater than equal to duration, that it's done. We can say it's enabled false, tween's.clear, we're done. To add a tween, we just uh, tween to add dot took tween holder equals this. Sorry, the line is through again. Um, so we assign uh, a reference to ourselves to the tween that we're going to add, and we add it to our array, and playing it just as a couple of variables. This update at the bottom causes trouble sometimes. So we, you don't need to do that slide. <coughs> All right, here's our tweens. So we have an abstract class for the tween. All it does is it defines this boilerplate uh, function that doesn't actually do anything. It's just something that you need to implement if you want to be a tween. And it has a reference to the tween holder. And here we go. We're going to uh, we're gonna put, yeah, so took position tween actually inherits the tween. And we're going to implement the onUpdate function to do this alert that we did before. And for the rotation tween, it's going to be something very simple. We have two uh, returnians that we're going from to. And we're going to, um, yeah, again, we're going to, we're going to also transform by slurping. Does anyone know why we slurp rather than we lurp with returnians? It's a complicated thing. It's because returnians exist on a four dimensional sphere, and we want to spherically interpolate instead of linearly interpolate. It's weird. Okay, right, we'll be, that can be another time. Uh, so yeah, how do we use this? Again, we want the usage to be really simple. So all we're going to do is just add a tween, new position tween, put the front of two, you're done. Add another tween for the rotation to 40 degrees around the one axis, let's say. Set the duration, set the delay, and then play. This is really lightweight in code, uh, rather in memory. The, uh, the tween objects, they just have uh, the numbers that you need, which is the, uh, the position from, the position to, and the rotation. So, yeah, I need mean, that to continue. Sorry. Here we go. So, yeah, here's the video of it. It looks pretty simple, and since it happens in code, I can't really show you what you would do in the inspector because that doesn't apply here. There we go. Okay. So, this is how we do most of the tweens. I do a couple of extra functions to help out with that, a couple of functions to make this a little bit simpler in Kansas City Shovel. But basically, uh, you can do a whole bunch more with this tweet holder as we can get to in, uh, in the, uh, the source code analysis. We can get that far. So, next up, we're going to look at the factory method pattern. This one's pretty simple. All of the uh, players in Kansas City Shovel, they can either be a human or it can be an easy AI, or hard AI, or none. And so, all you do here is use an enum to make a selection of which one is going to instantiate and populate the, uh, the, the players on the field. And then, yeah, here we go. Again, pretty simple uh, UML. We're not going to go too, too deep into this. Here we go. So we have an abstract player uh, and it has kind of a unified interface. You begin the card selection, you get the allowed card index that the person is allowed to play, you get the most advantageous card index, that's for the AI to use, but that's there anyway. And we have three classes that inherit from this. Human, easy AI, hard AI. This is the actual code in Kansas City Shuffle. And they all inherit from this parent class here. And all we're gonna do when we, um, when we start the game up, here we go. We have an enum for June, AI easy, AI hard, and none. Uh, we have a um, area of players in our main controller for the game. And we have a switch statement. So based on what the person set in the game settings, game settings, again, is a single thing, by the way. Uh, based on that, we're going to instantiate the proper, proper prefab. Uh, in a traditional kind of design pattern way, you just do new human mod, mod, mod controller or human 
control, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but in Unity, we have to be pretty fast for obvious reasons. Or no, there's no player there. Pretty simple. Too crazy. Uh, so that's the uh, factory method pattern. So basically, choosing the class you want based on enum. No, it's not too complicated. But the uh, again, the power is in being able to just think of a player generically, and an AI player will respond to the interface automatically, whereas a human player will respond to the interface with touches and so forth. Uh, input is, uh, I would say, like asynchronous input based on buttons. The point is, though, that interface uses coroutines instead of like synchronous code, so you, it knows to wait for input and so forth. So that's where that gets powerful. All right. We're going to look at finite state machine now. So this uh, is not a classic design pattern. It's not to be confused with the state pattern. Just like here. Uh, it's a very common and powerful organizational pattern with a lot of applications, including animation and networking. There's a couple of them. So the current state basically controls another property like position, scale, and can be queried. So in the case of Kansas City Shuffle, uh, a, a card can be one of four states. It can be obscure, it can be visible, it can be able to be selected, and then it can be selected. So basically, I'm not time yet. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show all these four states. Basically, obscure is face down, visible is face up, able to be selected. It comes, it pops out of the, uh, it pops out of the, and the play field a little bit. And then if it's selected, it gets scaled up. And so basically, uh, all of these states are going to change, or uh, yeah, they're going to change the position and scale and kind of rotation to go face down of the card. But also, you just want to be able to query, hey, what's my state right now? Am I able to be selected? Am I selected? Uh, and then, um, you know, also be able to do things with that. So. A pretty simple example is going to be a switch state in our enum again. Uh, so we have an enum to define the states, we have a switch statement to execute the code to put our object into the desired state, and an extra aside is that you may want to keep track of which state you just came from in order to make your code slightly more um, efficient or if you really need that information in your logic. Oh, sorry. And there are more advanced kind of implementations called concurrent and hierarchical F F FSMs. Concurrent FSMs just means two of them right next to each other. Hierarchical are more, um, they're more complicated. Uh, but, but they're also used as in, in a lot of games to, to, to demonstrate the complicated state. So let's look at the code here. Got another enum, obscure, vis visible, able to be selected and selected. I find it funny that the obscure is Obscured by the lines on these monitors, but we continue. All right. So when you set an ending state, you set to one of those. Uh, in my in my code, I happen to have this extra thing that says perform tweens. So this will um, either it will just uh, perform the tweens or not. Basically, it'll either just put it in that state or it will actually perform a tween to do it over time. Uh, so if state is not equal new state. So we don't want to, there's no point in doing it at the same time if you're in the same state. And you have the last state equals the current state, then you actually set it. And now you have a switch, and you have three different functions, or four different functions in this case, in this case to kind of select a behavior based on what the new state is. And so the reason we do this is I can go to the card and say, hey, what state am I in? And they'll tell me, visible, able to be selected, selected, and Whenever I set the state, I don't need to also worry about setting the position, the rotation, and the scale. And using the last state, we get a completely deterministic system. Of, sorry, that's a hard word that I'm not going to have time to define. Where uh, the, the state will, also, will always be kind of taken care of for us. Uh, the actual implementation of that is yeah, a little bit bigger, but in the interest of time, it's kind of what it looks like. So, okay, so that's that. I'll tell you, I'll yeah, we'll get through the rest of this, not too much, too much more. Um, any questions before I go on? My was in my room, pretty good. So the command pattern, this one's incredibly important for, oh, sorry, 
I should mention the game, these are mostly meant for turn-based games. You can probably find uses for these in real-time games, but in particular for turn-based games, the, the way that I structured these tweens was, was, was very advantageous. Uh, so another aspect of turn-based stuff are commands. And now this is one where I kind of wanted to use the wait, wait, we'll get there. Okay. So this is used everywhere. By everywhere I mean it's used in Word, it's used in probably web browsers. Um, it's used whenever you need an undo and a redo button, basically. This is the main use. I don't know of any many, many bigger uses for it. Um, so the Basically, yes, the basis of most of your reading button schemes must be able to keep a history of state and switch between them at will. Um, basically, yeah, this is going to be storing state in a way. It's going to be storing by state, I mean, like, what is the state of all the variables that we care about? Um, so, yeah, so here's the demo for this. So, here's our tween again. What we're going to want to do is move the card, have an undo button pop up, undo that movement. And then redo that movement. This is our kind of test case. So how do we do this? So this is interesting. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an object that represents a function call. And it's actually going to call that function at some point within itself. But most importantly, this object is going to store all of the arguments that the function needs. And then it's going to store all of the function, all of the data or arguments that the function would need to undo itself. And you're just going to store that in a command, in an object rather, in a, a, a command object. Then you have a commander object, which kind of keeps track of all this, your undo redo stack, if you will. It is actually you're supposed to use a stack, I use a I think I used a say it. I use an error in this example, but you're supposed to use a stack. I do use a stack in Kansas City Shuffle, but kind of redo this for the uh, presentation. Uh, so, call the undo function. We'll call undo on the latest command object that was. So, when you push, when you when you execute a function, you instead create the object, you push it on the stack, and then you just you just do it. You just uh, execute the do function on that object. You see what I mean in a second? Uh, yeah, this is the UML. And then when you want to undo. You call the undo on that object, and then you go to the, the previous object of the stack, if it exists. And then you can continue to undo that, and you kind of have this array of objects that, by calling undo or redo on them, and going to the next object on the, uh, the array, you'll be able to go through the different states of this object. So in this case, we have another kind of similar between, we have a commander, which has a bunch of commands, each command, in this case, let's say call it a position or rotation command. It has a do, an undo, and a redo. Oh, I should mention the reason these are red is because these are protected. That means these are uh, virtual, and these override these implementations. So here we go. We have commander, execute, undo, and redo. It's not, it's not, not too bad. As for an interface, we'll see the code now. So here we go. We have a command, which is just some abstract kind of uh, functions, you can do, you can undo, and you can redo. And redo, by default, just calls do. I have to override that in a couple of instances, like shuffling, because when you do a shuffle, it has to be random, but when you redo it, it has to follow the same randomness as when you did the first time, otherwise your state gets messed up. <coughs> Thoughts. Okay. The commander, we have a list of commands. Here we go. Our current command index is negative one. So we don't have any commands yet. And when we execute a command, we're going to say, okay, what's the next command uh, index, I should say? We're going to remove all commands in front of the one we're placing because we don't know where we are in the stack. And we're going to add the command in the stack. We're going to say, current command index is now. The one that we are the, the next one in the excuse me in the stack and we're gonna do it and then to undo all we do is if current command index is greater than excuse me <coughs> greater than zero commands this says this commands current command index dot undo uh, and the redo we're gonna do if current command index is less than commands dot count minus one Commands plus plus current index dot redo. That's the whole thing. 
And that gives us all the functionality that I just explained with the sequencing. And all we have to do now is write our commands. We have position and rotation commands. Looks kind of similar to what we had with tweens, but this time we're just doing equals. You could very easily do a tween here, which is what we do in Kansas City Shuttle. All right. All right, we're still doing all right. So what does this look like in practice? Here we go. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna have six cases. So there's gonna be an example with a keyboard on the screen. A will execute a command, S will undo it, D will redo it, so will X and C, and Z will do a rotation version of this position. So every time you press A, the object is going to move uh, up and to the right. Every time we press S, it's not going to just move down to the left, it's going to undo the up to the right movement. And this means that we can now store a kind of state of all of these actions that happen. So what that looks like is the following. So here we go. We have a cube. We're going to hit A, and this is doing the command that's going to go farther. S will undo it. D will redo it. So but notice if you keep pressing D, it won't go further because there's nothing else to do. And then, yeah, if you, if you erase the, the uh, future history by executing something on top of it, uh, you can't go into the third state. And then we can do the same thing basically with rotation. We do the rotation, undo the rotation, and then we can redo the rotation. Oops. No, no, yeah. And that, oh yeah, so that's the other thing. If I kept undoing, yeah, here we go. So we're redoing all the way and undoing all the way. And we can stack as many position and rotation commands as we want on each other. And it will always have the state to maintain uh, its consistency. All right. Get to the end here. One last one. It's very easy. Uh, excuse me, two last ones. This one's easy. The next one's a little bit complicated, but we can get to questions after that. We'll have about 10 or so minutes, and then you can see source code after that. Uh, here we go. Scriptable objects. I stole this picture from gameprogrammingpatterns.com, which is a, it's kind of what we're doing now. It's you know, more inclined towards games. So this is more of a memory efficiency thing, but it also helps with organization because whenever you have Fewer, you know, fewer variables in memory, you have fewer uh, problems you can, run, you can run into. So it helps reduce data duplication, it encourages good design and data representation. So basically it's very simple. Instead of copying data to every instance of a class, we have a bunch of trees here, which have mesh, bark, leaves, uh, and then you have some position, let's say, of params. These mesh, bark, and leaves for all of them are probably going to be the same. And so all you do is you keep the, the uh, different data in different trees, and then you have a reference to the common data, which is the model, mesh, bar, and leaves. Pretty simple, and Unity does this for you automatically with something called a scriptable object. It requires a user class to inherit from it, and then editor code to create an asset for it. And the asset can be edited in the editor, and then referenced by the monitor behavior. And kind of, you can get this data in real time. So this is the uh, scriptable object for the animation data in Kansas City Shovel. And we have, these are the card, you know, the height that the card moves when it goes to the deck or whatever, or the delays, different delays for, uh, you know, because when you have a card coming in, there's a delay, and then there's another card coming in, so there's some delays for that. And we just have all this data that a lot of uh, objects are going to use in order to determine what properties to put in their tweens. This is all just accessible when you reference it in the editor. And of course, there needs to be a little, uh, yeah, there it is. There needs to be a little editor script to create these assets. But once you've created them, you can use them. Very easy. That's very useful. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah, here we go. So this is a bunch of things. So yeah, you create uh, current animation data, and then you Fill with all the values that you need. There's the asset right there. And then all you do is pick, reference it in your monitor. And now you have access to all that data, and it's efficiently stored in memory. And you don't need to worry about creating a whole bunch of them. All right, last one. Last, last slide, really. So here we go. <sighs> Events, right, there's three of these, OK? What this is is a dynamic function. 
So usually when you call a function, uh, like move five blocks to the left, it's always the same one. A dynamic function, you set the function it's going to call, and then you call it. And what this lets you do is very, very, very crazy things. So for instance, whenever a tween ends, you can't see shuffle. We have a car finishes its movement. Usually we want to do something after that, like front the user for input or move another card. If we have a function that gets called at the end of every card movement and we assign some behavior to that function, we can change what it does at the end of that animation. It's kind of what this is trying to do. All right? So here's an example. So this is a callback. A callback is another word for this. Uh, observer pattern is similar to it. So here we go. We have a unity event. We have an action. There's another one call. Are we only doing the three? Uh, event. No. Wait, wait, wait. Delegates. Wait a I don't think we're doing delegates here. Oh, the uh, delegates is going to be one moment. You'll do mid function. Yeah, here we go. This is the delegate right here. Okay. So in the start, we have this uh, event. And an event is an array of delegates. And a delegate is one dynamic function, a function that you can change what it does. So basically, we have a function here, event function. And all this is going to do is remove itself from the event, and it's going to log a string. Okay. So whenever we fire event right here, whenever we invoke event as a function, like you just call it a function, it's nothing really complicated. It's going to hit this event function because we added it here. And then it's going to, this, this function will remove itself afterwards in order to clean up. It's a very common um, pattern. So, so that's, the, that's the event. The unity event works much the same. Uh, the unity event, it, except the problem is, this is the problem. The thing that's useful about a unity event is you can set that function in the editor, and you can actually make it do, do things in the editor. All right. And finally, yeah, we have a uh, we have a delegate. This is one delegate that gets called as well at some point in the function. In this case, it's going to be a anonymous lambda function, which uh, which takes the transform position of this current uh, mono behavior and it uh, makes it one, basically vector three dot one, one comma one comma one. So what we're going to see when we start this video, okay, so we're going to see in the debug logger, we're going to see start function, it's going to wait five seconds, and it's going to do this mid function, which it obtains from the argument, which it obtains from the parameter rather, which it obtains from the argument, which is a function. So when this hits, we're going to see the position of one of the blocks change. Then we're going to wait another five seconds, and we're going to invoke the unity event, which we're going to set in the editor at the moment. And then when another five seconds is done, we're going to fire this event. You'll see C-sharp event uh, in, the, in the console block. So here we go. Let's try to keep this here so we can keep up with what's going on. We have one cube, another cube. So in the first cube, we're going to look at, we're going to add an event. Yeah, we're going to add an event. This is going to be our callback event, and here we go. So this is the unity event. You can add something to do. Here we go. We have this object, Q2. All we're going to do is, yeah, runtime only. You can do it in runtime or editor. Go to game object, set active, true, false. We want to set active false. So when this, uh, yeah, when the unity event hits, that second block will disappear. All right, it's going to start down here. So the first thing we're going to see is the mid function, which is that's going to go to one, one, one. Think there it is. That's five seconds. Five more seconds. The unity uh, event will invoke. Think it's gone. And then the C sharp event will invoke, and we'll get C sharp event on the console. That's all the different types of asynchronous events that you have. They're to be used with coroutines, generally speaking. You can use them synchronously as well if you, if you wish. All right. Hopefully you got through all that. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, humoring me and letting me speak here today. And hopefully you got something out of this. Hopefully 
this is something that inspires you to go a little further with programming uh, in, in Unity, and hopefully it makes your lives slightly easier if you want to go and do something really, really big and ambitious and complicated uh, with Unity. So for reading on the bottom, I will see if I can have a PDF and a PowerPoint conversion, this is, you know, a PowerPoint conversion of this that we can, I can post if you guys want to scrutinize it a little bit further. Um, and yeah, just enough time for a couple of questions. So, I know it's a lot to take in. This is fine if to be confused, please. So like whenever you're uh, like adding a new feature and you're, if you're like, oh, I could use this design pattern. Do you ever like study like, oh, maybe there's a design pattern for this? So. Yes, exactly. So, all right, let's let's take the tween for example, right? It's it's kind of complicated because it, it's happening over time, right? Um, you might want to do multiple things to it over time, and it would be a real a really big pain. Okay, so we're gonna go back. Let me go back to that video. Yep. Oh yeah. So give me one second here. It's still in the video, we just look at the game. So, this is the next screen, so it should hit. Okay, there we go. It's this St. Louis now, whatever. Um, so, yeah, so basically, there's a lot of tweens going on here, right? So this, this camera is tweening, all those cards are tweening. It would just be a massive pain for me to write, have on these cards, okay, where do I need to be right now as one function and be like, okay, I need to be in the middle of all this and everything like that. So, I figured, how can I organize this? Basically, when using the design patterns and choosing one, the best mindset is, how do I organize this code a little better? How do I really utilize the tools that OOP, Object Oriented Programming, is trying to make me use to make my life easier and I actually go and do it and make my life easier? That's it's the best kind of explanation I can give. But yeah, if you study them and you kind of get what the, the, the if you're studying them, make sure to look at the examples and try to understand the examples. And if you don't understand the examples, find better examples. Uh, the gameprogrampatterns.com uh, website that I mentioned, yeah, gameprogrampatterns.com, so on the bottom, this particularly has very good use for program, uh, examples rather for games. It is a very good resource. It also has the finance issue when it calls it a pattern. Anything else? All right. Um, we have a little. Do you mind if I show a little? You want, you want to do anything? Or I actually realized that this laptop doesn't have an HDMI port, so you have all the time you need. Oh, do you, do you have a mini display port? No, it doesn't have anything, unfortunately. Well, that's the problem. Okay. Okay. So let's let's take a little look. Let's do a little demo. So there are a couple of things I wanted to show you. Uh, the first thing is this little piece of code right here. So this is what I mean by um, this is what I mean by private is a, a inherited and not accessible. So here we have a base class, we have a protected function, and we have a private function, and we have a public function in the derived class. So this is the private function. Okay. Now notice in the test. All right. We go scroll down just a bit. We do new derived dot one. One is going to call two, two is going to call three, and three is private. And when you run this, you're going to see that it says console dot right line sneaky. And it's a private function. Now we didn't create any bases here, okay? We only created a derived. So we're going to run this really quickly to see a very unexciting result, but an important one, because this tells us, oh, there it goes, okay. Never mind. It should say sneaky. I ran it before. We had, I tried to mess around with Safari to get the dynamic content, whatever. There was some DRM that Apple was uh, insisting that we use that we didn't want to use, so we kind of got around that. But anyway, um, so, so yeah. So here, I'm going to give you a quick example uh, as well. There was one more. Was it there? Oh, yeah. Just the just the general gameplay. So yeah, let's, let's just play a game of this real quick. So yeah, so we have a bunch of cards coming in. These are all tweens. When they're done, all right, there's another thing I use called a waiter, which is basically whenever you start a tween, you put it in an, an array of tweens, and there's a waiter object that just waits for all of them to finish, and then it fires, again, a delegate at the very end to be like, okay, now all those initial ones have finished, 
So now start dealing to all the players. So if the player exists, deal to his thingy and um, to, to his card holder. And then, yeah. So these are what the card states I want to show you. So we had, um, if we look, just a moment, let's, let's minimize this for just a moment. Uh, if we look, you know what I mean? I'll fall, I'll fall. Sorry, I get to this it's good. So if we look at the, so this is hidden right here, visible. Let me play one card because you're going to see the rest of them in a second here. Okay, so we have hidden are right here. These, oh, of course, I can't, whatever. When they're up, it's able to be selected, and selected is when you actually touch them. So the, the code for that, just a moment, is going to be in the card view finite state machine, I think. And there's the function we saw. And in each of these, you basically have, okay, obscured state. All right, what was my last state? I, I go a little bit more complicated on this than you may want to. But basically, we just have a return tween, and we add an incremental scale tween uh, to get it back to its regular scale, which is all we need to do. And then we can also go to case within this, which is a little bit much, but anyhow. Uh, we, can, we can look at these get tween types, and we can alter their, uh, say, alter their properties and so forth. Um, the, the main thing that's very important is that let's say, all right, so this is, the, this is the big one. This is everything that kind of, excuse me, orchestrates the last time I drank an energy drink before a presentation. Um, this is, yeah, so here we go. Here's a command kind of example. All right, so we have a move card command. And so we're going to move from player I hand, and the, let's look at the, the names of the arguments. Okay, it's a little hard to see, but we have from, from holder, from index, to holder, to index, and visible or in between. Five arguments to this function. All right? We're going to have uh, also, yeah, I use a named parameter to kind of skip this to index. So basically, we're going to go from the player's hand, um, index zero to the deck. This is all you need to know for this, for this, this transition, right? Uh, and then, when you have that command, you execute it and add it to the current turn bundle. Uh, so the way the turn bundles work, I'll give you a quick little deal deal right here. So the commands, all right, they get bundled, all right? Here's a command, here's a command, here's a command. Okay, and then there's another turn bundle. Here's a command, here's a command, here's a command. Okay, and then these, so we have an area of turn bundles, and then inside of them is an area of commands. And basically, uh, we, as we execute commands, we just kind of stack them on the end here. Okay, and then when we're done with the turn, we bundle them. Okay, and then when we press the, let's go back to the game here real quick. When we press the undo button, start in just a moment. <laughs> Oh, this is also fun. We need different times, time scales, yeah? Fun? Yeah? Real time. <laughs> Have fun with the time scales, guys. Uh, okay. So, okay, so let's play a card and we'll do the undo function. So all those, all those things that just happened, those were all commands, okay? The cards moving were commands. This is mostly just cards moving, but there's also, this changes as part of the game's uh, logic. These numbers are scores, they change. All those changes are commands. The position, yeah, the, the card, which card holder it's in, and what index it's in, those are all put into as a command. And that command is then, when it's done, it gets bundled as a turn bundle. And we're like, okay, here's our command. And when we undo it, we, we call undo, undo, and then we're here again. And if we do it again, we do undo, 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 and then we're here. And then we do redo, we go redo, 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 and then we're done. And then we, Redo, redo, if they do it again. So that's where the redo uh, bundler, the undo button here comes from, think, and think. All right, and so yeah, I see that the middle thing changes from a question mark to a direction. It's kind of how that, how that goes. And then, yeah, if you, if you do this, oh, there we go, I just won that one. So, oh yeah, so there's the shuffle, right? The shuffle is a command, so when you undo, guess what, you have to, Unshuffle, and then it actually goes into the old state that it was. And if you redo, you 
You can't shuffle randomly, you have to use unshuffled data. So there's actually data that holds where each card is and was for that shuffle, and then you have the same state that you, you started out with. So there's, so there's that fun stuff. Um, some other notable design features. Uh, there's no reason, if you quit, there's no reason to pop up a screen and say, are you sure you want to quit? Just hold it, <laughs> hold to quit, that's it, okay? It's not that, you don't need to go too crazy on the, on the UI design, right? Another fun thing, this is a complicated game. If you want to look up the rules, there is absolutely no reason you should not be able to play while you're reading the rules. Zero reason, okay? Just play one, there you go, okay, and then close it, all right, there you go. Nothing too crazy. Okay, we have some fun. Oh, oh, pull, pull it. Okay, there you go. Pull it out. Have some fun with the different animation speeds. Animation speeds should not be a hindrance to fast play. Okay, if I'm an expert and I want to do this, I should be allowed to do that. No problems. Okay, and of course that applies to the undo as well. Think, think, think. Okay, and yeah. So another thing is, if I play this, notice that the redo button is gone now. Is it erased all uh, the uh, the future commands? So yeah, that's that's the whole entire adaptation. The rules are as follows. In case you're curious, there's a bunch of rules. Wild card animation. Now, all these have. Okay, so this is why I need to really organize this. All of these rules are if statements in the main menu controller. Actually, the main game controller. So. Basically, I have to have these if statements, and they're going to cause a lot of complexity already. So, again, telling the card to go somewhere should really not be more than two, one or two statements, and most of the time it isn't, thankfully. So, this is kind of a way to organize all that good stuff. Uh, so, that's that. I'm trying to think. All right, so is there any part of this game that you'd be curious to be like, oh, how did you do that? Like. Is there any part of this game that you would say, uh, how this looks really hard and you didn't explain how you did that? If there's anything like that, please feel free to ask. Now's the time I'll show you the code where it happens. I yeah. Go ahead. actually wondered about the, the shuffle animation. Okay, shuffle animation. So that's, so that's fun. That's really fun. Okay. Is that, is that complex? Or so I'll show you the shuffle code. So we're going to go. So I'll show you the. Uh, another fun thing is the card holders. So the card holders follow the strategy pattern as well. Everything is a card holder, okay? And we have classes that inherit from it. One of them is the deck. The deck actually inherits from the card pile, which in turn inherits from the card holder. But we refill, we deal to, and then we refill with, and then we shuffle. So, <laughs> all right, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's a little bit much. So uh, we have the cards to shuffle from, and the cards to shuffle to. We have the unshuffled data that I mentioned. So when you unshuffle it, you have to make sure that the state um, returns to normal. And what that is is basically an area of numbers that maps, you know, zero to zero, one to one, and kind of where it's supposed to go. And okay, so the location of the shuffling is pretty sense bad. Let me see. Here. It's been a while since I looked at this. Oh, there's that waiter. Okay, so you have a finishable group waiter and not finished. So what happens is this waiter. Where is it? Where is it? The animation, yeah. So shuffle animation waiter, add finishable. Uh, this is the tween holder of the last card. So basically, yeah, so you do these for all the cards. You pick a random location in a unit sphere about two units up from the deck, and you do a, where is it? Position ping pong tween, my favorite word. Position ping pong tween means go from one position to the other one, and then back. And that's it. So we have a position ping pong between. We'll see where that goes. It's an extension method. And basically, it does that thing that we did before. Uh, you add position ping, yeah, tween holder, dot add tween, new position ping pong tween, and the arguments. And the logic is right here on update. Uh, so percent done. Uh, I use an in out ping pong animation curve fast enough. Don't worry about that. That's, 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 that's an alteration function for the for the, uh, it distorts the percent value basically. So normally it would move like this. Now what this does is it makes it move like this. Okay, that's all it does. Or like that if you're doing it the same way. So the ping pong means go and go back. Uh, so we alert, position from, position to, ping pong function. And uh, yeah, and then on the way back, we just go from, what does that say? Position back to, from position to, yeah, sorry. 
darn thing is here. There you go. Position back to it. So that's, that's what that is. And so when all those are done, it fires the on finished, and that triggers um, dealing to the players. So that's how that works. Can I have one more? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Where do I begin? OK. <laughs> so this is C sharp. This is trying to utilize every single possible organizational advantage that C sharp can offer. Uh, I'll tell you where I went to learn this. Very simple. Uh, here we go. Go right to that. Right, here you go. Uh, where is C sharp? OK, there's too many. Here it is. This is where I learned. If you Google C sharp intro, this is the first thing you'll see, and this is very good. So here we go. On the side, we have home overview environment program software, classes, enums, structs, polymorphism. Does that sound familiar? There you go. Pink. And then you have the advanced topics, attributes, that's reflection. Uh, where is yeah, anonymous methods? Is that what it is? Better be. Okay. Yeah. So and then there's useful research. If you can somehow get through that whole tutorial, this whole thing, it's not, it'll take you, if you're really every day, you do one, that's a month, tops, okay? Um, you can understand all the source code in Kansas City Shuffle if you really push your mind to it. It's, it's, it's trying to be organized in such a way that you can read it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I had to look back at this code. I changed some things for this talk. I wrote this code two years ago, okay? I went back to use, oh yeah, more than organizing your code, here's the test for if you've written good code, okay? Can you look look back at it two years from now and then be okay with what you wrote? Hello, Wes. Hey. Nice to see you. Um, you missed a fun party. So if you can if you can read the code that you wrote, uh, you know, six months ago, two years ago, that means it's probably pretty good. And I, and I did. I read this code. I understood it. And I was like, oh, there's a couple of changes I can make. I know exactly where to go to make them. And it's not uh, a hair pulling. I, yeah, go ahead. So, so before, I, before I forget my question. Yeah. Uh, what I was asking was that every, in the Kansas City Shuffle game, yeah. everything that goes on, does it inherit from a certain class, for example, but the graphics, like yep. when the, there are certain commands that the game runs by itself, like when you run a game, it starts to do the car shuffling thing and yeah. for the graphics and stuff. So is it, so do you take like separate, I guess what I'm asking is like, is there like an automatic class and then you take from that main class and the computer does everything itself versus a, Player, uh, player decision class, where like I said, I press start, I press question. Is it two separate codes or is it un all, all together one? You know what I'm asking? Or kind of. Are you asking like what's the difference between the uh, the code that gets run when you press a button versus when the game starts up? Okay, so the game that gets, um, I'll show you what, don't you dare, bad boy, it has to take forever. Okay, so. <laughs> Let's go to main menu. Where is it? It's main menu. I'll show you what the, this is kind of here to UI. We'll look at the canvas. We'll look at the main menu canvas. There is a big black overlay on this, so you can't see it. There it is. We got some Laura Ipsons. And let's look at the button container. So let's also look at this in 2D. Come on. Come on. Don't be a, be a sourpuss. All right, so here's our screen, OK? Here's the button containers. All, by the way, uh, all these, if you want to do good UI design, these are all based off, based off percentages of the screen. I'm going to show you something real quick here. Um, if you if you play this on an iPhone screen and it's all wide, here, give me one minute. I'm going to show you something. This is all, you should also always test your UI, right? If I do this, it should not crash and burn because the aspect ratio is over two, all right? All these are based off of screen percentages, and it, and it counts for every single menu in the game, okay? Uh, so this is your UI, this, this is an aside, I apologize. If you, I'm pretty sure there's no static elements, so if you just shrink, take this, come on, come on. 
So, uh, another thing, very important, you can act, you should be able to access all the cards. Yep, bare, uh, barely. You can barely get that ace, but you can access all the cards from here too, because that's the fun. So, yeah, uh, this comes a little bit, yeah, so you, it, you can stretch the, you know, you can stretch the meaning of it and so forth, but anyhow, if we do this, we go really, here, stop this, stop that, play, uh, whoops, not saying that. Play. There we go. This will actually work out, so you can you can actually play it from here too. So anyway, yeah, sorry. Uh, back to the task of hands. Sorry, sorry. The events that get uh, executed when you press the button are as follows. Here's your play button. Here's a Unity event. Unity UI uses Unity event. On clicked. Main menu controller. Mod controller. I say model controller. Mod controller. Dot play game. Bink. That is a public function. In your main controller script, yeah, there's a lot of data on there. Uh, if you go to play game, where is it going to be? Huh? Uh, play game, play game, pink, load scene, main game. That's it. That's all it does. And the difference between that and stuff that gets automatically run, there's two main functions that get automatically run start and update. Those are the majority of the functions that I use here. I use an init scene to initialize certain things that need to uh, persist over scenes. Do that with a do not destroy and load function call. And it also shows up in the editor like that, so you can keep track of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's functions that get automatically called that start and update. Otherwise, you can call them yourself, or you can do it with a Unity event. It's asynchronous, right? The, all right. I'll show, you, I'll show you something else for the, for the actual cards, okay? This is where it's going to get a little bit nasty in terms of uh, delegates, but, but we'll, get, we'll get there. Where is my player? Who's there? It's players. So you have your abstract. All right. So if we kind of shrink all these. All right. We have an is human rule, we have begin card selection, this is abstract. So begin card selection for a human, okay? All this does is it lifts the cards that you're allowed to play and it activates those buttons. That's it, that's all it does. The buttons, when you click them, it will make the cards move, it will submit the cards, it will make them travel from your hand to the deck, and then it will end your turn. When the AI calls it, the easy one, or, yeah. When the AI calls it, here's what it does. Instead of presenting the cards, get allowed card indexes. Main card selection algorithm, if you have an allowed card index count created, so if you have cards you can play, there's a main selection algorithm, Otherwise, end of the player turn. And no, it, that's a, I believe that's, um, what does that say? Card indexes, yeah, so there's no card indexes to play. You, you, didn't, you didn't play anything, you lose your turn in this case. But that's it, that's the whole thing. If you look at the human one, it's a little nuts because you have a lot of, um, you want to do. So, uh, tutorials as well. This is, yeah, tutorial code, yeah, yay. Oh, love tutorial code. Um, that's, that's sarcasm. So, submit cards, where's the, where's the, where's the begin, begin card selection? I think that's, yeah, begin card selection. So we have our uh, card indexes, uh, process command system. Yes, yeah, so this is the command system. So a player just started their turn. Guess what? You're ending turn bundle here, and then you're going to start a new one. Okay, set card states. Okay, so it's all stuff, that's fine. Clearing the delegates, yes, submit the cards, set card states. Set card states. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the 
Anyway, this is a set. Okay, here we go. Read cards, view of sound, set animation state. Okay, selected, able to be selected, visible. All right. This is this gets called every time you touch a card, every time you drag a card. It kind of just refreshes the states based on what you're doing. So all we're going to do is set the animation state, basically based on some uh, criteria. Selected card indexes contains index i. Uh, if you've selected this card, set the animation state as selected so it shows as such. And that will call a tween function, which does a tween uh, to show that over time. Uh, Allow card indexes. Oh, also, one more thing on the note of UI design. There are five ways to submit a card in Kansas City Shuffle because I don't want to know what my player is used to, okay? If I, all right, here we go. One, select, play, right? Another one, just drag it in, okay? Another one, double tap. Another one, force touch. I don't have force touch, but you get the picture. And the other one, yeah, just drag it in. So I think it's probably one I'm missing. Oh, yeah, there's, you can multi-touch these as well. I don't have a thing on there, but yeah, you can, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different ways. So, the, basically the reason that that class is so big is because it has to support all those. Where's my, yeah, so these are the states. Uh, oh, there's, don't look at that. That's the interest here. Don't, all right, you want to see, I'll show you that. That's, you guys, you guys came out here. No, yeah, it's, it's secret, you can't show it. No, it's, yeah, no one's going to see it, and it's, it's cute enough. Okay, so you need two players. So, do you? Yeah, it doesn't matter here. All right, ready? That's my wife. Aww. Yeah. That's worth it. That's worth Now here's the problem. What do you play? I don't know what to play. Do you? Uh, there it goes. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. And there's also a ready button to be like, oh, okay. Can now I'm ready to pass the thing on to another person. Can the player do that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for the player. That's just. No, I like the magic. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. You know what? There's, a, there's an even crazier one that is going to take way more time to show, so I'm not going to show it. Yes, sorry, go ahead. I have a question. What well, about, um, I guess, uh, your process for an actual code? Yeah. So uh, I'm in the process of uh, porting a game from uh, Code Ghost TV using Decker Seeds Unity. Oh, boy. Going through, uh, it's been a pretty you know, fun ride so far. Yeah. I was curious, what is your methodology when you're looking at, I'm coming from pure inheritance classes to deal with more components? And some of the other point where I'm just wondering what's the best way for me to approach the situation. How do you refactor, how do you package, how do you both decide this is the way for us to um, go about building this feature? Okay, so here's the thing. What, what happens oftentimes is the following. You, you, you want to you you make a game and you write the code without quite thinking about the consequences of it. I'm not saying you, I'm saying in general, this happens. And then what happens is, let's say the game hits Somebody asks you to port it, or they ask you to make a sequel, and all of a sudden that thing you thought you were just going to leave to die in obscurity as source code from which the binary was built and you're never going to touch again, all of a sudden you have to go back into it. And so this is why I'm advocating for this kind of coding style. And so the answer to your question is, I haven't done a lot of objectives, I haven't had any objective C from being 100% honest. Uh, um, they stopped using it and now I have to learn Swift. And this is kind of, I have, I have issues with Swift. Uh, anyhow, the, so, so yes, to answer your question, what I would do is if they have a coherent kind of methodology for their design of code uh, and you can understand it, try to learn from it. And yeah, you can use inheritance in C Sharp as a You can do it. Um, and a component really is just a, a field. Like it's, it's, it's just saying, okay, I have a list of components. Somewhere in the bottom behavior, there's a list of components, and you, or excuse me, excuse me, somewhere on the game object, there's a list of components, and all the engine does is call the start and update functions, as well as a whole bunch of other ones you can find in the documentation. Those are the important ones. Um, and that's, that's all that it does. So if your methodology fits into that, great, use a component. Otherwise, if you need inheritance, just use inheritance. Uh, the, the, the bigger problem I would think, because I haven't used Objective C since I've been with a great result, is imperative versus strict OOP object-oriented programming and event-driven programming style. Uh, 
And if you're dealing with that, ask yourself, is there a unity equivalent of if you see something in objective C, is, is there a unity equivalent to this? Generally speaking, the answer is yes. C sharp contains most, if not all, common features of today's programming languages that you would need that I assume that objective C would have. Um, and then implement it that way. If you don't like the way they did it though, don't be afraid to say, it's gonna cost me more time to understand their flawed thinking and then implement it in a new engine that it will for me to do this wrong. And if you're thinking that, don't be afraid to say, I'm doing it my way. And if you're confident in your, in your methodology, I've developed confidence in my methodology over years of experience. Uh, it may not be that way. It may be, you know what, if you really trust the guy who wrote it, and you can look at it and be like, okay, he had some sense to him, this is clever. If you're learning things from his code, and you like looking at it, that's a sign that you should follow it. If you can't stand looking at it, if you use bad identifier names, if you use bad structure, uh, you know, see what you can, you know, take from the structure. And you know, assuming it's an iOS game and they want it on Android, right? Uh, well, it's my own game, so I'm the developer, uh -huh. uh, so I'm pointing my own stuff over. Okay. Uh, so, so I, it's just a matter of like what you said, it makes a lot of sense. It's just me uh, make sure I'm going the right way, where I'm just like, oh, I can meet me. This is here already. Yeah. So opposed to me already like implementing the system, I can just really use this and cut off like five or two lines of code and just keep on building. So I was just looking to get that your your methodology and just make sure that yeah. I'm not like skipping or like uh, cheating yeah. by abandoning code for certain things. General general tips. You said chop off higher the last code. If you can do that, totally do it. Uh, also, if you have a huge uh, file with just a bunch of stuff and you can break it up into more files and it makes sense, go ahead and do that. Um, also, if you can get rid of a, any kind of state, if you can get rid of um, a, a field, like any kind of field, do it, just do it. And if you have, here's the thing, you want to you wanna embrace a functional methodology. And what that means is get rid of as much state as you possibly can because that's where bugs come from. Bugs come from not being able to, you know, with your brain, keep track of all the state. That's why we have debuggers that show us all the state because I don't know what's going on with it. So if it's not there and it's, you know it's dependent on another state, then you can just write a function to get that other state, alter it a little bit, and return it as you want. So I'm going to give you an example of this. I'm going to show you some source code from my, my most recent game, uh, Pictominoes. And you are going to see a lot of properties, which are basically functions, that take some state and, and tell you exactly uh, what you want to know. So here's the pentomino. All right. So you see all these little get returns here? Okay, some of these are necessary because I have serialized fields. Don't look at those. This, this, these are the most important ones. Okay. Is over tray. Basically, I have is over grid and is off tray. And there's all right, there's two trays, one on top and one on the bottom, and then there's a grid in the middle. And if you're, oh, excuse me, don't ask a bad example. I apologize. There's a couple, yeah, so the, here's, all right, here's a better. Is being dragged. All right, when you start a drag, I set this variable, okay? And when I end it, I set to null. So you can tell if something is being dragged by whether it's null or not. But Putting that in an if statement looks like garbage. So if you just if you just put is being dragged, and this is a very obvious derivation of this type of data, you don't need an is being dragged rule. You just have this thing and you test if it's not. This is a very simple example, but there's oh, here's, here's a couple better ones. Okay, your snap position. Let me just think. This is oh, this is not this trade position is better. Here we go. Uh, okay, so tray position is basically there's some pentominoes on a tray on the bottom of the screen, and you want to know what position it should be. What is my home position? There is a uh, there is a array of pentominoes. It better be here. Let me find it. There, uh, pentomino index. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, it's here. It's here. So the pentomino index. That, uh, that's just a bite. Okay. That's fine. You, it should be based on this uh, position in the pentagon. Anyway, that, that, that's, that, that works. So maybe that, that's fine. That's fine. So there's an index. So this pentagon has a number from 0 to 11. That's 12 numbers because we have zero number. 
Um, and this is just set in the editor. And it's like, okay, where am I going to? What this is, is don't, so this is, this is one of those ugly if statements that you need to have to support different uh, user preferences. So, yeah, just look at this. This is the important one, okay? You have the index, right? Using the screen width, okay, and where you want the Y position, you can distribute them along the screen, the screen based on that index. You don't need to have another variable called home position that you have pre-calculated this from. And so this way, you can change the Pentano index, and guess what? That, that property will just update when you need it to. There's no problems there. And you're deriving, you're basing data off of existing data. There's no reason to duplicate this, is what I'm trying to say. So this is another key concept of like making the code a little bit nicer and easier to work in the future. Sorry if that was a little long to answer your question. Really laid the back yes. of, yeah. um, of the design patterns that you have been working with, have there been any cases with the Unity Engine where you're like, I just have to modify the design pattern to fit the behavior of Unity? <coughs> so the nature of design patterns <coughs> is generally <coughs> such that um, you're intended to modify them regardless. Like you're, so design patterns, when you look at the thing, it gives you examples of how to use them. I'm trying to think, there probably is one but I can't think of an exact. Yeah, there you go. Here we go. Here you go. So this is kind of the case. Um, usually, you don't have these groups of commands. Usually, you just have a bunch of commands. And then you, what? You don't have these hard uh, OK. So yeah. So you don't have these groups. You just have a big old area of commands. But I. I'm not undoing commands, I'm doing turns. And a turn consists of several commands, right? So that is a good example, actually, of how I think of it. So yeah, again, this is to get you thinking in different ways. And design patterns really, the moment, what they generally are is, this is how you use uh, polymorphism. So there's like 20 of them. And this book, there are criticisms of the book as because it was written a while ago, it's not infallible. And there's there's patterns like the null object pattern. Like, obviously, you can just set something to null. You know what I mean? Um, there's the strategy pattern is really close to um, the abstract factory pattern. Like, they're, they're, they can be used together in a way. Um, there's a couple of interesting ones, like the visitor pattern is used in compilers and not very much elsewhere. It's, it's kind of a complicated one. Anyway, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's probably a fair answer for that. Yes, please. Okay, you might go over this. Uh, you have a bunch of inheritance. Yeah. Is everything at the core inheriting from the game object? No, 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 no. So I'll give you an example real quick. Um, Go back to the top of the sun, which is the name of Kansas City Shuttle, if I already named it. And if we go to the tween holder, okay. So the tweens all inherit from tween, which is just the glass. And because they're only holding data, they don't really need to be a model behavior and get also. What we, so there was a part of this, uh, I'm going to show you really quickly, a very important slide from the inheritance, which was this one. Okay. Uh, all inheritances, okay, is you take, yeah. this means take everything here, okay, and put it right here. That's not free, all right? That's space that's being used up in the RAM, not a lot, obviously, but if you're on an iPhone, especially one of the first ones, now we're spoiled, we have limited, almost limitless RAM. It's not free to just put things here. And the, furthermore, in order to properly use a model behavior, you need to put it on a game object. That has costs associated with it. You have to add the model behavior component to the game object. You have to add it to this you know, list. And there's all these functions that get called, like the start and update function. And so if you don't need to make a model behavior, a, model behavior, a, a class of model behavior, then by no means there's no reason to, to, to do it. So, uh, the way you get a rough, so this one actually sh could have been a model behavior to get uh, access to the tween. What I did here is I have a cache to transform tween. So that thing I said about functions, um, 
there's a cost to that. If you, if you, if you base data, uh, derive data, you derive it from existing data instead of putting it in a, its own variable, there's a cost associated with that, and that is you have to calculate it every time you reference it. If that becomes a problem, use the profiler. Use uni, the Unity profiler and to say, okay, this is taking too much resources, I'm going to cache this result, and then I actually need to, you know, set it as dirty if the value, if the underlying value changes, and then you can uh, get rid of that problem. Anyway, this is similar. If you do uh, game object dot transform dot position, uh, if you look at that on the profiler, Unity will give you a little uh, caution, exclamation point symbol, because you're not supposed to do that. You should be caching the transform reference and then using that to um, to alter the position and stuff of the. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll show you what that what that looks like. It's R. It's going to be uh, no, let's do this position tree. Here's. So yeah, the position tree is not much different from what we saw here. Uh, I just I do a, a curve on it to make it look a little nicer. Uh, but yeah, so we use cache transform position instead of uh, tween holder dot game object dot transform position, uh, which saves us some cycles. So yeah, even getting the transform is not free. So it, yeah, it's important to look at your um, your profiler as well. Let's do that actually really quickly, just to kind of do a slight bit of grabbing, I guess. Uh, the performance of this bad boy, um, even with all these effects going, we can't sell. Ah, ah. How are we doing? Ah, ah, ah. Four milliseconds. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So very little, very little overhead is what I'm trying to say here. This is stuttering because the, the profile window is is horribly, horribly a lot of stuff going on in here. So this will actually make the frame stutter. But basically, like this is 250 frames per second. You don't. We have effects going on, we have transparency, we got, it's not a lot of stuff, to be fair, but it could have very easily been a lot of stuff. Even the, the, little, the little spikes, the little spikes where we're switching gears and we're starting a new tween, they're still, they're like a millisecond of tops. So use this thing. This game will run on any, like you can put this on an iPhone 1 and it would probably be fine, uh, minus the graphical effects. Anyway. Another, another good habit to get into for sure. Uh, so I'm going to answer. Anyone else on the question? Any other questions? I got a lot of time. Skip, man. Big time. Um, yeah, go ahead. How much time did it take to uh, make this? Uh, okay, so there's one more little experiment we can run. Just give me one moment. So the answer is uh, it took me about two years of free time. Okay, During that time, I was going to school. Working for idols, I was probably in the midst of starting the uh, company that was Elastic Games, which did Last of the Nightmare. Um, let's see. And so, if I would estimate, I would probably say, um, give me one second here. I would probably say, probably eight, eight months if I was doing it full time. So two years of free time, eight months of, um, the, the big thing is you also have to, have to wait for like the artist to finish the, um, the say it, the art, yeah, art, all the graphics and so forth. I'm gonna do a really quick execution here. If you have another question, go ahead. This is a nice little program you can use. It's gonna be, one second here. Uh, Yes. We need remote taxon. Is it going to do it? No. It's spazzing out. It's doing something. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's, it's, something. it's doing something. Alright, so this is a little Perl script that will, um, it'll go through your entire, this is just something fun to do. It'll go through your entire, say, it, uh, code base, and it will count all the lines of code, it's clocks, count lines of code. And right now, it's taking its sweet time. But if I'm not mistaken, so I actually I removed a bunch of code right before this talk because I saw very small optimizations that could be made. 
Um, also, if you really want this source code, or you, yeah, if you come up with a question that I didn't answer today or didn't have answered, time answer, wow, that is, what is that thing doing? I've never seen that happen before, sorry. Um, just curious. Also, yeah, feel free to activity monitor. What are you doing? You, you had your uh, email up there, right? People can yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit you up. It's, uh, yeah, please. Go ahead, nevlumx.gmail.com. November Echo, Victor, Usurper, Mike, Xavier, at gmail.com. Um, wow, I've never seen you do that before. That's a little bit upsetting. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it will finish one day. Keep it running while we can see. Yeah, we can. Yeah, is there anything else? Uh, we just have a couple announcements. Please. Please tell me.